Good morning, Maine Master Naturalists in Training. Today we're going to talk about getting started with birding. There are five things that you need before you go out birding. The first is a decent pair of binoculars. The second is a field guide to birds. In the Maine Master Naturalist class we use Sibley. And the third thing you need is something to track the species you see. The fourth thing is what I like to call the most important tool in a naturalist knapsack, and that's curiosity. And I know you're all very curious people because that's why you're in this class. And finally, the fifth thing you need is patience. Like learning any new skill, it takes a while to become proficient at birding. There are days when you won't see any birds, or very few. There are times when you will get a really clear look at a bird, you'll see all of its field marks, you'll hear its song, and you still cannot narrow it down to what species it is. And that can be frustrating, but it's part of the process. And it makes those moments when you recognize and identify species that you didn't know before all the more exciting. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about the first three items and then we'll get started. You do not need the top of the line, most expensive binoculars. Start out with what you have. If you don't have a pair of binoculars, see if you have a friend or family member who can lend a pair to you. And if you're in the market for buying a pair, there's some good information on the Audubon Society's website. The things you need to know about your binoculars. First of all, most have a um, either gasket around each eyepiece or a little plastic dial that moves up and down. If you wear glasses, you want the gasket or the dial to be down. If you don't, you want it to be up. That creates the proper distance between the lens of your eye and the lens of the binocular. You also want to have the binoculars the proper distance apart to match the distance between your eyes. So hold them up to your eyes and adjust until you have a pretty clear kind of elongated circle with no dark half moons on the side, no double pictures, and no darkness in between. In binoculars, you are able to have a separate, different focus for the right and left eye. Hold your binoculars up and look at something in the middle distance that has distinct outlines. It might be the sign at the trailhead. It might be a corner of your house. Put your hand over your right eye and then adjust the focus of your binoculars until that item you're looking at is very crystal clear. After that, switch and put your left hand over your left binocular, and then you'll see that the right eyepiece is adjustable. This is called the diopter. Turn that dial until the thing you're looking at is in crystal clear focus. And then it should be just right. As far as your field guide goes, before you go out, take some time to familiarize yourself with it. Read the introduction and then what Sibley calls bird topography. This will give you a lot of the vocabulary words for the parts of the birds and the field marks you'll be looking for. And then look at the way the book is organized. Most bird books will be organized in the same fashion, which is taxonomically starting at the very beginning with loons and grebes and going to the end with the finches and old world sparrows. So I like to have a little pocket-sized notebook and a pen. When I get started, I'll put down the date, the time I start, try to remember to put down the time I end, I'll put down the temperature, the weather, if you have a way of tracking distance like a, a fitness device, a smartphone, or a map of the area you're going to, that's some useful information. You all know that I'm a huge fan of journaling and drawing, and there are three ways that I like to use drawing to help me identify birds and to reinforce what I learn about birds in the field. So the first way I use drawing is I'll draw birds before I go out in the field. When I was new to birding, I had this got this book called Common Birds and Their Songs, and I went through and I drew all 50 of the birds in this book and wrote down some of the identifying information and listened to the CD that went along with this. And it helped instill in my brain the characteristics and field marks of those common birds. 
If you don't have that book, you can always use another field guide, one with bigger pictures and photographs. You can also use the internet. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology site, All About Birds, has great photos and great information about birds. You can also listen to their song. So you might go there and just draw a handful of birds that you might expect to see, and that will give you some knowledge before you set out into the field. The second way I like to use drawing to help me with birds is I'll draw them while I'm in the field. Quick sketches in your journal guide, look at the information about gesture drawing, and that's basically what I'll do. I'll look at the bird with my binoculars for as long as it will hold still, and I'll study things like the bird's shape, its size, the length of its tail, the shape of the tip of its tail, how long the wings extend beyond the body, the size and shape of the head, the size and shape of the bill, and different markings it might have around the eye or on the wings, and then and colors. I'll and study those for as long as the bird holds still, and then I'll do a quick sketch and fill in as many of those details as possible. Only after I've done the drawing will I look up the bird in the bird book. At least two benefits, I think, come from this. One is that it helps impress on your memory those details. It also prevents you from getting confused when you look through the bird book and you try to remember, did I see that? I don't remember, I'm not sure. You'll definitely have that, those notes. And it also, I think it helps reinforce it in your memory. The final way I like to use drawing to help me with birding is after I come back from the field. I'll draw the birds I've seen, especially if they're new species, or if there's birds that I have a hard time remembering the difference. For instance, the kinglets were driving me crazy. I couldn't remember which was the golden crown and which was the ruby crown. So I finally drew a picture. Are you ready to get started birding? Let's go. When I first walk outside or arrive at my birding destination, I like to stop, look, and listen. Are there any birds in the trees soaring overhead, rustling in the grasses or bushes? When I see a bird moving, I'll train my eyes right on that spot and then raise my binoculars. I don't lower my head and then bring up the binoculars because then I'll lose the bird. So hold the bird, laser like focus bring up your binoculars and that should be there. If not, bring them down again, look for it again with your naked eye, or scan the trees. Adjust your focus, and then when you see the bird, take note of what it looks like. Does it have distinctive markings? What color is it? How big is it in relation to, say, a chickadee, a robin, a crow, an eagle? When you've seen all that you can see, if you know the identity of the bird, you can write it down on your list. If you don't, make note of those field marks, whatever you see and whatever you can remember. Or draw a picture, like I mentioned earlier, which is really ideal, with as many details as possible. If the bird's still there or it's moved to another place, look at it again. It might, you might see something different from a different angle, or you might get some clues about it based on its behavior or its habitat. What kind of tree is it in? Is it up high? Is it on the ground? Is it in shrubs? Is it near water? These are details that's important to take note of and that will help you identify that bird. Let's go look for some more birds. Any place you're used to seeing birds, such as at your own feeders or at a nearby pond or any other place that you're familiar with birds congregating, is a great place to start birding. Definitely not cheating, even if you did put the sunflower seeds out for them. Sometimes when you hear birds in nearby trees, you can call them in a little closer to you by making what's called a push sound, like this.
Chickadees are especially susceptible to this treatment. Often they'll come close enough that you can get a pretty good look even without binoculars. When you start down a trail, move slowly and quietly. Look around in every direction. Don't forget about up so you don't miss soaring eagles or hawks. Edges between ecosystems, like where this forest ends and this meadow begins, are often good places to spot birds. So when you come to a transition or an ecotone, Take a minute to look around and listen. Brushy areas like this are also good places to find birds. My little friend, the American Robin. This is a bird that you might see a lot of if you have a barn or a shed kind of outbuilding. They like to nest on human-made structures. It says its name, Bibi, Bibi. And it writes its name with its tail, meaning it has a tail wag. When you approach water, do so slowly and quietly so you don't spook any ducks or other water birds that might be nearby. Scan the edges of the water to see who might be hanging out. Do you see that bird? There's a very distinctive yellow spot on its rope. Now that we've returned from our birding expedition, let's look up some of the species that we saw. First, we saw the chickadees, which probably most of us know. We saw the American robin, which again, I'm guessing most of us already know. We also saw the bird that was writing its name in the air with its tail and saying its name in sort of a grouchy voice, Phoebe, Phoebe. And that is, of course, the Eastern Phoebe. And we had another bird that had a yellow spot on its butt. We didn't see it very close. It was overall sort of a dark bluish gray, bluish black. It was a small bird. And I know that warblers are coming back to me at this time. So I'm gonna just give warblers a try. And at the beginning of a lot of the family sections is a, a picture of a, many of the birds. So you can sort of compare them to each other. And I'm just looking for one that has that yellow spot. Oh, look, here's one, yellow rumped warbler. So if I look at the yellow rumped warbler on page 340, I see that it's in Maine in the breeding season. I see that it's a grayish dark bird and that it has a distinct yellow rump. The male in breeding season also has yellow on top of its head and yellow under its wings. I didn't get a close enough look to see that, but I definitely saw this yellow rump patch and I'm going to call it a yellow rumped warbler because there aren't any others that have that truly distinct mark. So that's a pretty good birding day, even if we didn't see a lot of different species. We had a good time seeing the ones we saw. I hope that this is helpful for you as you get started birding. Have fun out there and enjoy the beautiful birds of Maine.